Hello, and a very cordial welcome. I'm so very much delighted to see you all here because since February it's been the first time to have so many people here in this hall. So I believe that we can be a little bit confident at least to see um, things happening again. And of course, today we are going to talk about bioeconomy. But before we start with our discussion, I would like to call on Dr. Stefan Brandt, Director of Futurium, our host. Well, of course, I'm also very happy to see so many of you here. And of course, we have a lot of plans put inside this hall. So, uh, of course, we do believe, you know, it's a very full room now. Uh, I would like to welcome you to our Vision of Bioeconomy Forum. And of course, uh, we should have also asked the question, how can we actually get there? Nevertheless, we decided that we wanted to focus on future-oriented action and not to be so um, much of um, a person who wants to be, you know, a skeptic. No, there are many important, many clever people who are dealing with this question of how our form of economy can actually become more sustainable. And of course, this is a good news because we need a lot of ideas in order to make that quantum leap. Um, all kinds of um, materials that need to be reinvented, uh, whether on the basis of mushrooms or textiles from other fibers, etc. So we all um, have these ideas and we are showing them in our exhibition as well. Many people know about that, but we all realize also that our um, type of our form of the economy cannot continue to exist uh, because if everybody on this planet would actually follow suit on what we are doing here in um, our latitudes, uh, this uh, would uh, not lead us anywhere. It would lead actually to a collapse. However, the question is how come that we have not yet come further in our approach. I mean, we in Germany always think we are champions in, for example, recycling. Nevertheless, recycling values here um, of plastics, for example, do not go beyond 60 percent. Why? Why is that? And of course, there are no simple and no easy answers. People are convenient, are very comfortable, and many of us really um, are convenient or feel uh, we want to act comfortably. But then, of course, there are also pathways, dependencies that play a role and that make it difficult to actually go beyond what has been established. Of course, there are also others who call for radical change, fast change, and who have different opinions here and in other societal fields. They say, OK, differentiated views are needed, um, something that is practice oriented, something that uh, many people can join, um, but something substantial has to change. And of course, this is um, something that we have not come up yet, uh, with yet. So actually, we feel that uh, we are not daring enough. We don't take steps that are big enough, even though we do have uh, much of the information that is necessary to do so. So maybe these are external shocks that uh, we need in order to make us act. And Corona, the Corona pandemic might be one example to the point. So this festival tries, therefore, to go beyond boundaries, to try and make people understand better, discuss better. On the other hand, we also want to encourage people to actually um, get into action because 
Uh, it's awareness we are talking about, and it starts with each and every one of us uh, in our private lives. And then, of course, it translates into our actions in society and in politics. Futurium is the house of the future, and this is where we are trying to actually come to an exchange between the sciences and uh, coming up with a new definition of interdisciplinary man matters. And of course, we are also um, talking with artists. And uh, we believe we do need all these different types of opinions and um, associations and um, uh, opinions uh, from all over the, well, different types of disciplines we have in mind in order to come to concrete and specific conclusions. This is why we are so very happy to also cooperate with the International Literature Festival that is also um, actually uh, dealing with bioeconomy bio with that topic um, in, as a topic. And of course, uh, Ulrich Schreiber is here as the director of that festival and of course Heinrich Böll Stiftung and uh, um, others are also, you know, our sponsors. And so, um, Maya Göbel, Christian Greve, Claudia Kempfert, and Andre Schneer Magnussen. These are our panelists, and Rico Grimm is our moderator tonight. Uh, they are going to discuss various aspects of uh, bioeconomy. Where are our common grounds for all of us uh, to, well, use as a kickoff, basically, in order to get to where we want to be, a sustainable economy. And how can we go beyond our um, convenience um, in order to get beyond uh, what we have today? I do hope for you know provocative statements, uh, for discussions, fruitful discussions, and uh, I would uh, like to thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, back over to Rico Grimm. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Brandt. And now we have to wait a little bit because of hygienic uh, instructions. Of course, uh, there is going to be a change in microphone. And next is uh, Ulrich Schreiber, the director of the International Literature Festival in Berlin. Well, it's really full here in this hall. Well, yesterday we were in the Chamber Music Hall uh, where we had an event yesterday and the day before yesterday and Madame Grutas actually mentioned, oh, not so many people here. But as was mentioned before, it's the plants that uh, create a wonderful atmosphere as well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, dear Madame Kepler, dear Stefan Brandt, dear Andre Schneer Magnussen, Maja Göbel, Christiane Greve, Claudia Kempfert, uh, Franka Ostertag, and uh, Madame Peterson. I would like to welcome you all. So I would like to welcome you on day three of the 20th ILB to the opening event of the series present, present and Future Perspectives of Bioeconomy within the context of the 2020-2021 Science Year of Bioeconomy. So um, we are delighted to be able to continue to help shape this dialogue between science and literature with our series this year because um, we are thinking in terms of dialogue on controversial issues also underlying uh, researchers that we want to listen to and to see what is happening in the scientific institutions. So we are very happy, uh, as I said before, that we can help shape this dialogue this year. And we already started in 2005, where we shared our interest and uh, we talked about the democratic opportunities. And ILB actually talked about the culture of um, getting older. Uh, Georg Stefan Troller and Robert Schinder actually talked about this. And in 2004, the new level computer games and literature was also an interface that we took up. 
And uh, here we talked about uh, different concepts of computer games and developed them. And we also went to Cologne, mind you, to um, talk about that on Gamescom. And then um, also later on, we talked about the future of the cities, former uh, director um, of uh, Bauhaus uh, Foundation actually was the curator. And then we talked about oceans during another year. Twelve authors, international authors, presented their texts on the topic of uh, the oceans and then talked about also about fields such as ecology, geology, biology, etc. Um, and so intelligence was another issue. And now this year it's bio economy and 18 um, international authors are have been invited by us in order to uh, read their texts um, literary texts of different genres so the graphic novel and the comic actually was added and so there are readings there are discussions and also uh, with children's literature uh, children's books for example um, that is a topic that is included in this field as well. And so we are talking about the basic uh, principles of bioeconomy and mm, try and dare give an outlook on the futures of bio bioeconomy. So uh, research on this topic is going to be presented and there is going to be a discourse between scientists and literary artists um, talking about this. Uh, so literature and um, science will provide an uh, inkling to the public at large about what we talk about here. Transformation, technological ch change is a buzzword. Well, and uh, there were other fields that uh, we were able to also tackle. The Hay Festival, for example, gave us an uh, impetus, a small town. Uh, where, uh, well, I think, you know, 70, 80,000 uh, visitors were counted in previous years, you know, even though the city is so small. Nevertheless, of course, in June this year, it was canceled. Uh, but there were so many interesting festivals and impetuses, as I said before, that we could learn from. And so um, this is something that we actually picked up. Um, so. Actually, this is an event that uh, we are streaming live, and I'm very happy, actually, that we can do so. I would like to thank uh, especially uh, um, my staff, especially Hannah Roberts. So where is she? Oh, over there, leaning at the door. And uh, of course, she was really responsible for developing all of this, uh, you know, this event uh, together with us. And then, of course, my thanks also go to the Office of the Year of Science under the ages of Frederick Peterson and others. Then, um, of course, the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And thank you so very much, Mr. Brunt, um, to, uh, for being our host at the Futurium. So, Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you so much. Now, head of section, Oda Kepler. She's responsible for foresight for the future, and she's the sub department head of the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. which actually is last but not least. As I learned, this is a kind of bilingual event, and English is the language of scientists. I decided to give my speech in English in honor of our author from Iceland, in honor of all the scientists, and it's quite unusual being a civil servant. Usually we are order to talk German, but I think I would like to talk, ta take this opportunity to talk in English to you, dear Mr. Schreiber, dear Mr. Brandt, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. To find the truth, one must discuss. 
It is with this quote by Peter Weiss that I would like to welcome you to the opening event of the Visions of Bioeconomy program as part of the International Literal Festival Berlin. I'm impressed that you were able to organize this attractive and exciting festival program under the auspices of the Peter Weiss Foundation for Art and Politics, despite the current special circumstances challenging every one of us. And I also think it's beautifully decorated, not really noticing that there are not so many people as we were used before the corona crisis. I would also like to thank the Futurium, which once again provides a forum for discussions about the topic of bioeconomy. I have fond memories of the opening of the Science Year Bioeconomy here in the Futurium, and the Futurium also hosted the evening event held as a part of the status seminar of the BMBF funding measure Agricultural Systems of the Future. In particular, I would like to thank the numerous authors who play an active part in the debate. The solution to various global challenges in the fields of climate change, energy transition, nutrition and mobility will depend on scientific findings and political decisions. Decisions which also need to be supported by society. The coronavirus pandemic has once again shown how important transparent communication and the dialogue between science and society are, and that's why we are all here. The BMBF attaches great importance to science communication. The core objective of the science years organized by BMBF, and Mr. Schreiber just quoted some of them, is therefore to encourage debates between science and society. The passion for societal debates and the ability to think outside the box are also inherent characteristics of the International Literature Festival Berlin. By the way, both the Science Year and the festival are celebrating their 20th anniversary and have successfully cooperated for many, many years. The literary exploration of topics in science and disciplinary exchange have always added new dimensions to the debate. This year, international authors are addressing the concept of bioeconomy. The Visions of Bioeconomy program covers major questions related to economization, the rights of nature, land as a resource, as well as specific questions in the fields of nutrition and forestry. I am sure that it will provide fresh stimulus for lively discussions. I understand that some of the literary visions also challenge the concept of bioeconomy. I welcome this perspective as we must discuss the technological, economic, ecological and societal implications of bioeconomy together. Returning to the quote by Peter Weiss, the goal of this debate should be to find the truth. I was therefore delighted to see the subtitle of this bioeconomy program, Literature Meets Science. That is a promising title, and it is exactly what we all need, a discussion that transcends disciplines. As a representative of the Federal Ministry of Research, I especially welcome this. I would now like to give you a quick overview of the BMBF's vision of bioeconomy and of bioeconomy research, because I'm confident that together with the scientific community, we will be able to shape a bioeconomy for the benefit of our global societies and our planet. This is exactly the right moment to write, read, and discuss about the visions of bioeconomy, despite or even because of the coronavirus pandemic. The business community, politics, and society have become aware of climate change, species extinction, and the finite supply of fossil fuels. 
Many people are willing to do more to protect the climate and to preserve the natural resources and nature in which, with which, and from which we live. And we all have to do so. Bioeconomy seeks to offer solutions for making our lives and economies more sustainable so that we don't consume more than we can produce and our planet can deliver. And how can that be done without sustainability limiting our usual quality of life? The solution to this question requires us to think about economic, economic models which build upon biological cycles rather than work against them. Bioeconomy is a promising approach to achieve this. It uses biological resources, processes, and systems to generate new products, procedures, and services across all economic sectors. The Federal Ministry of Research, the BMBF, has provided funding for bioeconomy research for around about 10 years now. It was not that popular then. In March of this year, the Federal Cabinet adopted the National Bioeconomy Strategy to systematically continue this course in research. The strategy serves to align the federal policy on bioeconomy even more with the objective of a sustainable and climate neutral development in future. The new bioeconomy strategy directly addresses 12 of the 17 sustainable development goals included in the 2030 agenda. Global food security, climate neutrality, and the protection of life on land and below water are primary objectives in this context. Future research funding provided by the BMBF will focus on the expansion and use of biological knowledge, systems, and processes. In this context, the BMBF also supports the exchange with other disciplines and the translation of research into industry. The implementation is very important to have an impact for our future. The interaction between biology and the increasing digitalization of technical systems holds a great deal of promise. Researchers are working to optimize processes and production pathways for chemicals that were produced on a biotech basis, thus providing the chemical industry with sustainable alternatives for fossil resources. If we want to replace fossil resources, to the extent possible, we must expand our raw material base. Plant research and agriculture are particular focus areas in this context if we want to produce more efficiently while protecting the climate, our environment, the earth we are living in. The BMBF provides funding for projects related to the soil ecosystem. A new funding measure will investigate the mechanisms behind plants' epigenetics, thus helping to make plants more resilient to droughts, floods, or pests. Furthermore, we must use resources more efficiently. To do so, we must establish resource cycles and use residues and wastes. And I learned we will drop the word waste in future because there will be no more waste, just residues. Some of the first products of this kind are showing what is possible. T-shirts made of coffee grounds or leather made from residual fish skin. The BMBF also provides funding for the so-called BioBall Innovation Space Program that intends to promote the meaningful use of municipal green cuttings or food waste in the Frankfurt metropolitan region. The direct exchange between private and municipal companies, science and politics generates ideas on how to close resource cycles and reduce greenhouse gas emissions while creating sustainable products. Ladies and gentlemen, the transition to bioeconomy is more than a mere technologi technological task. 
It is also about societal change. We require a productive dialogue with society and all of you to drive and accompany this change. The transition to bioeconomy will require several processes of change. Many of them will have far-reaching consequences and will require careful consideration of various causes of action. We can only grasp complex relationships if we adopt a comprehensive perspective and take the context of social and political sciences and economics into account. This is especially true with regard to the bioeconomy. Since 2014, my ministry has therefore provided funding for the systemic investigation of interactions and of desirable and undesirable effects of bioeconomy. Which course can bioeconomy take and what would be the consequences? What would an increasing demand for biomass mean and where might conflicts arise? What is the effect of measures mitigating conflicts such as yield increase or the use of residues and waste? Those are the questions we are asking ourselves, we are asking our scientists. However, this kind of research must also adopt a global approach. Among other projects, researchers are analyzing the effects of bioeconomy on migration, resource conflicts, or biodiversity at a national and international level. We also need a quantitative assessment of the contribution bioeconomy makes and can make to a sustainable development. That is why we provide funding for a bioeconomy monitoring system. The system analyzes biomass flows and value change, chains and calculates the footprints of bioeconomy. Which resources does bioeconomy consume at a national and international level and how does it affect the climate and ecosystems? The first results have shown that we are on a promising way in a number of areas, such as forestry, for instance. In the field of agriculture, however, we still need to become more sustainable. The agricultural systems of the future I just mentioned measure ser serves to work towards this objective. It aims to connect bio biology and digital transformation to produce sustainable innovations. These innovations are intended to reduce the use of chemical plant protection products or to generate innovative systems for food production in closed energy and material cycles. As you can see, the BMBF supports numerous research teams and disciplines in contributing to greater sustainability. During the science year bioeconomy, the BMBF aims to give people an understanding of both the potentials and the challenges of sustainable bioeconomy. The Literature Festival is an important forum for discussion in the context of this science year. It promotes active analysis of one of the most pressing issues of this time. And now I'm sure that just like me, you are looking forward to hearing the discussions between Andre Sneer Magnussen and the colleagues in the panel. And I'm also looking forward to many interesting ideas and exciting discussion with Christiane Greve, Claudia Kempfert, and Maya Goepel. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ms. Kepler. Now, I'm telling you right now, we are going to finish late. I think we are going to finish five minutes late. If you really have to go on time, please do so. But we are going to require five more minutes. Why? Because we have so interesting guests here today. To my right, we have Christiane Grefe. She's a journalist in the Berlin editorial office of Die Zeit. She's published many books. And her last book is called Bioeconomy, Overexploitation or New Economy System of the Future. So the first question is to her. To her right, we have Claudia Kempfert. 
Born in 1968 in Delmenhorst, she is an economist and she is at an institute researching. In case you have no clue what she does, she can tell you what happens if you phase out or uh, decommission a coal energy plant and what that does to the Europe-wide coal power plant. I mean, we have to switch off coal power plants. That's her opinion. For 10 years, she's been researching how that energy transition can be successful. She's published several books. Monday for Future is one of her last books, and she sketches out what the plans should be. After Fridays for Future, what comes next is her outline. To the outer left, we've got Maya Goebel, born in 1976. She, she actually has a PhD in economy and political economy, and um, I'm happy she changed career paths and has decided to go elsewhere. She's now a very important voice in the sustainability discourse, and she used to be Secretary General of the Advisory Board to the German Federal Ministry or government, and she's now the scientific head of a think tank called the New Institute. And this year, our Rethinking Our World anew is her new new book. Andres Neermagnusson, sitting to my left, born in Reykjavik in 1973. He ran for the Icelandic presidency, but this is not why he's so famous. He's also a writer, author. He's a natural philosopher, if you will. She, he wrote many fictional books and non-fictional books on the story of the Blue Planet, and he always deals with the topic of environmental changes and destruction in his home country. And one of his texts is one of the most read texts of the past, of the last year. I'm sure you've all read it, or most of you have read it, though you didn't know the text was from him. And what this text is, I'm going to tell you later on, a text by Andres Magnussen, and we're going to read it to you by Matthias Czerwinikas. When I started writing this article, I was at my grandparents' summer house on the Melrakasleta Peninsula in the northeast. My grandfather was born there in 1919. It is probably the northernmost house in Iceland. In 1950, the farm was abandoned, although the area was long considered one of the best in Iceland, with driftwood from Siberia, eiderdown feathers and seal colony on the beach, waters full of trout and seaweed that the cattle could eat in harsh winters. On average, around 30 people lived on the farm. But as mechanization with its tractors and the idea of economic efficiency to cold, the farm could no longer keep up with the productivity of modern farms and could hardly feed a single person. People moved to the towns and the farm fell apart until my grandfather renovated it around 1970. Since then, the farm has served the family as a summer residence. Grandfather's descendants, these are children who grow up in the cities all over the world. Here, they build up a connection to the past and can experience freedom with a playing radius of 10 kilometers. When I first came here as a child, there was no electricity. And we had to chop driftwood to boil water. We accompanied Grandma when she searched for nests of the eider ducks on the beach. She walked bent over with a stick in her hand because there were also Arctic terns breeding there and they will attack anyone who comes close to uh, their nests. The eider ducks already knew my grandma and remained sitting quietly until she stood directly in front of the clutch. She collected some of the down into a sack, but she always left enough to keep the green blue eggs warm. The relationship between humans and eiders is special. The eider duck is a wild bird, but they like to nest close to humans especially when they are looking after the nest. The bird plucks feathers to pet the nest. Humans collect the feathers, and in return the bird gets protection from predators such as fox, mink and gull. The down feathers are super light. My grandma managed to collect up to 10 kilos over the summer. This product is correspondingly very expensive. One kilo costs around 1,000 euros. In Japan, you have to pay 10,000 euros for an eiderdown quilt, which again shows just how distorted the value chain is. To the disadvantage of my grandma, but this, uh, that's a whole other story. Now, when I read the term bioeconomy, 
up there in the north. I thought that the relationship between humans and Idas is probably the perfect relationship between humans and animals, because both benefit. The animal remains free and humans are content to collect down feathers on the beach. If any relationship between humans and nature worked that way, the world would be a completely different place. But I wasn't quite sure if I understood the term correctly, if that was really what bioeconomy was all about. So I was in the north and I looked at the Ida Ducks. I just published the book Water and Time, and throughout my research on the book, I had hardly ever come across the term bioeconomy. So I was curious if my friend knew it. I talked to a scientist with whom I've had many conversations in recent years. She has a PhD in earth sciences and is working on pressing CO2 into the earth. The carbon dioxide dissolved in exhaust fumes is mixed with water, creating a kind of bubbling water that reacts with basalt in the earth and becomes calcium carbonate, the same substance from which corals build their skeletons. These people are doing pioneering work. They are already pumping 10,000 tons of CO2 into the earth every year, and they want to increase this amount significantly. I asked her if she was a key figure in the world of the bioeconomy, but she wasn't quite sure. I work with rocks. This is not a biological process. Isn't that more like geo-economies? Then we talked about BECCS, B-E-C-C-S, a method to rid the atmosphere of CO2. This involves creating huge forests and cutting down trees after a certain period of time and then either burying them directly or burning them first so that the CO2 can be captured during combustion and then deposited underground afterwards, creating monocultures of fast-growing plants with the aim of burning them somehow seems rather dystopian to me. So again we got talking. Is that bioeconomy? As a scientist with a PhD, she is working at the forefront of solving the CO2 problem, but she was still unsure as to what this term exactly means. In the Icelandic folk tales, there are many stories about the priest Samandur, a scholar who lived around 1100 and attended a school of black magic in France. He knew magic and used it to make his life easier after he signed a pact with the underworld to acquire superpowers. This is how he got rid of a thousand goblins in one fell swoop who actually do weeks of tedious haymaking and other farm work. And at the end of each story, Satan comes and demands his reward, usually an unborn child or Seymandur's soul. And each time, Seymandur has to skillfully trick his way out of the contractual obligation. In a way, we are in exactly the same situation. Our superpowers, all the fire that we've kindled, hits our unborn children. Most generations of earthlings have lived so that their descendants could benefit from it, but we are in an intolerable situation. According to all scientific evidence, we are undermining the future. In 2019, I was asked to write a text for the Oak Glacier commemorative plaque, the first glacier Iceland has lost due to climate change. The Oak Glacier is the first glacier known by name to have lost its status as such. All glaciers in Iceland are expected to lose their status over the next 200 years. The memorial bears witness to the fact that we know what is happening and, and, and what we need to do. Only you know if we've done it. The bronze plaque also shows the measured CO2 concentration of 415 parts per million. PPM. When Watts turned on the steam engine, it was about 280 ppm. When you climb the Icelandic glaciers, it is hard to imagine that these huge masses of ice, as far as the eye can see and up to one kilometer deep, are fragile and disappearing. It is hard to imagine 
that in this mass of eyes on which you stand, you can fit the Empire State Building stacked on top of each other over twice, covering an area of several thousand square kilometers. It is impossible to comprehend something like that with the normal consciousness of an objective observer. This is the core of everything that is and will be, and therefore it is both an international and personal matter. And then there is bioeconomy. This word sounds good and familiar, like the logical extension of something I can understand. But the word doesn't sound like it means that everything I know and love is in danger. All my friends, my family, all the people I know and all the people I will get to know in the future. It doesn't sound like all the glaciers are in danger, all the ocean, all the coastlines of the world, all living things, birds, fish, insects, primeval forests everything. We've started the biggest fire in the world the world has ever seen, causing annual CO2 emissions of 35 gigatons. And we need to reduce this to zero over the next 30 years. This is one of the biggest challenges humanity has ever faced. We must put out all fires and at the same time find solutions to maintain the standard of living quality of life and stability in the world. At some point in time, we will have to feed and clothe 10 billion people, and yet we must preserve nature. We need areas that serve as biomass suppliers. But of course, we won't be able to produce as much fuel as today. Buzzword 666 volcanoes in this way. It's obvious that the economic system that will replace the oil economy must be different from the system that created oil. Well, thank you very much, Matthias. So if you have any questions, there are two people in the hall and they are going to collect your questions. All right, so of course, you know, because of the hygienic and, um, rules and regulations, we cannot provide you with a microphone, but they will be collecting your questions. So, Madame Griffin, we heard a lot about uh, bioeconomy, but uh, how would you explain to a five-year-old child what bioeconomy is? <laughs> After all, it's a very complex term. Well, thank you very much for your invitation. I gained a little bit of time before answering. So, and thank you very much also for having said before that I have not become a teacher. Um, so maybe I should uh, turn to Andre um, in order for him to actually tell us about, well, or the five-year-old, I would tell him, go to Andre um, to uh, learn about the eider duck. So I would probably take the five-year-old child to a garden. I would try and dig a little bit in the ground. And then I would show the five-year-old child uh, how many organisms there are in the soil, and then try and make him see uh, what respect of our ecosystem actually means, learning by doing, maybe. In order to come back to bioeconomy, I would probably also explain to him whatever he is doing, you know, whatever he is using, whatever, if he's brushing teeth, uh, if he's sitting on a cushion, all of this would have to be developed from biological resources, plants, um, organisms, residues, what have you. And that all of the things that have been produced on that basis, you know, the pans, breakfast that he eats, etc., that he shows respect towards all of these things in order for them to last as long as um, they can in order for everybody on the planet to have enough and in order for these resources to um, be going back to the ground and then that would be our idol uh, that would be you know the how i would uh, explain the term bioeconomy and i think this is also what many people um, 
favor. However, we are not doing it yet. And so, yes, there is a lot of technology involved and technology promotion is um, what we have in mind. And now I'm turning away from the five-year-old and turning to the 50-year-old because, yes, indeed, many people do understand different things uh, uh, using the term bioeconomy. They say it's a plastics word. Uh, everybody can define it his or her own way. Some people think, aha, by economy, that's bags. Well, that is absurd from my point of view. To have CO2 stored in the forest, for example, in forests that will maybe not even survive, as we can see nowadays. So I think that might be a wrong approach or genetic energy engineering or new genetic uh, uh, engineering forms. You know, other people think that this might be an explanation of the term or others uh, trying to somehow reconstruct Earth for it to uh, be able to actually deal with the fire that we set in a better manner. And then maybe if we talk about 450 parts per million, maybe we need to talk about other figures. There are people who say, OK, we have to become more efficient in our production ways. That might then lead to more energy input. Then people say, OK, bioeconomy is not an economical way of using resources, <laughs> just the opposite. And then there are also other approaches from the agricultural field. Here we have to think in terms of, um, you know, more things to happen on the fields, in the forest, etc., uh, in order to generate, uh, you know, new things. Well, of course, I could go on endlessly on that. So therefore, my point is, we have to know how we go about it, and this is what we need to discuss in order for us to have and show a different type of respect vis-a-vis -vis our planet. Well, thank you very much. Andre wrote that. Uh, sounds too good to be true. Madam Kempfert, taking a look at the debates, the current debates, it seems, well, Maybe we are having a debate uh, between people who are thinking, OK, let's become more tranquil. Um, others um, on the other side, there are those people who say, OK, we need to do more, more research, uh, more development in order to solve the problems. And so this is maybe the provocative question here um, in an event that is hosted by BMBF. Uh, can we keep out of that discussion? <laughs> Well, no, definitely not. And that is what we also heard uh, in the words of introduction by um, the federal ministry. And Christiane Greve also mentioned that it's a multifaceted uh, term. What we need definitely is better research. But research by itself will not provide us with all the answers because there are so many different um, fields that we touch upon, you know, SDGs, uh, sustainability goals, agriculture, uh, water consumption, um, hunger, you know, all of these have to be borne in mind. And there are priorities that we do have to consider. The production of food, for example, for us as human beings, no doubt about it, then the um, economic cycles, the life uh, cycle resource mm, production and um, development, while well, then in energy economy plays a role. And uh, biofuel, bioenergy, production of bioenergy, um, that comes to the fore. Nevertheless, it can also be problematic. Um, so this is my lengthy answer to your short question, but I guess we'll come back to that point later on. Madam Goethe. So bioeconomy, that is one complex term. But of course, you know, it's about economy as well. And some people have their doubts about economy or forms of economy. And in Silicon Valley, actually, some people say, well, synthetic biology 
uh, that you design nature uh, one way or another is the next big thing. So how important then is uh, the economy vis-a-vis -vis, um, the bioeconomy? What will be the most important thing? Well, uh, well, political economy, you know, this is, of course, um, uh, where I did my uh, doctorate on in that field. On the other hand, of course, I also studied communication, as I, you mentioned before. So if we talk about targets, if we talk about um, coordinates that we have to understand is, well, if we take a look at strategies, if we took, uh, take a look at, well, the economy, many people think, okay, we want growth. However, uh, bioeconomy is now going to actually um, come up with substitutes uh, for what we've had before in our economic, um, uh, the form of economy that we've had so far. So substitutes um, for those types of materials that we have found not adequate to our uh, needs or to what we want. So this is why bioeconomy and economy has similar roots. And uh, bioeconomy means regeneration, uh, somehow restructuring this type of economy. So economic activity has to change. And uh, this is part and parcel of the term uh, bioeconomy as well. So regeneration, diversification, uh, coming up with more resilient ecosystems, that uh, is a priority. So we have the overshoot day. Of course, we are using so much, uh, so many more resources that the planet has. And so um, here we're not even talking about, you know, this sustainability nowadays, but the target has to be, we have to basically come up with concepts that actually target the regeneration. Um, of uh, our economy. Of, this is a completely different target. This is why we then can come up with good um, targets with, uh, you know, the means that we need to define. So this is like green growth. Is that the buzzword you're talking about? Yeah, well, why is growth, you know, the goal we have in mind? Many economists uh, say, well, no, actually, it's not, maybe not the goal. But, you know, in the newspapers, actually, we um, say that. Um, so growth, is that really, you know, the ultimate goal? Well, no, probably not. And uh, this is why I'm looking for those who actually go back to the roots, uh, the roots of the unsustainable development. And I think this is the root. We are really not uh, able to talk about output indicators in a different manner and capture it differently. So this is why I try and write an article about it. Growth is just a means to an end, but it's not a means, a target for our political development. So are there any people here who would uh, go against that? <laughs> well, no. I'm also an economist, and I can only actually emphasize what has been said. Because yes, this term of growth has been misused in uh, the field of economy and also the term of prosperity. Actually, this is a term that has been around for, you know, like 30 years or so. And we had an enquête in uh, commission and we talked about this. And so it's nothing new. It is really a problem how to actually implement it. Yes, but research as well. Output indicator with all the decoupling studies, we're talking about a gross domestic product. Right. And this is why alternative concepts need to be developed. I think it's an important point. And I think you can also build bridges here. Bioeconomy, in order to be provocative, um, might be um, a complex term that presents us with, you know, uh, problems as well, because here we are talking about resources, cycle economy, uh, and um, people do not consider this if within the field of uh, the economy. And of course, concepts such as um, VEX, for example, they are definitely not 
really sustainable. We uh, can measure that. We need different concepts, and this is also why uh, we should uh, be aware that bioeconomy could also be a concept where we uh, would actually uh, move on to another type of overexploitation, for example. Um, so it's, of course, not only that we have only pros and only cons, but uh, and uh, here we are talking about promotion as well. Well, uh, Maya Goebel actually mentioned uh, what the market is producing uh, if you do not regulate, uh, if you do not think in terms of um, the narrow definition of sustainability, you know, of talking about agriculture, forestry, going away from, uh, you know, the economic forms that we have in mind. Um, this is something we have to bear in mind, and the economy, uh, of course, can also provide its answers. That's for sure, but in the field of agriculture, for example, there are so many problems. Uh, and this is where we see through that lens uh, why bioeconomy is such a difficult concept. Andre? Yeah, so you are not alone, as you can see. Other people also do not know exactly what bioeconomy is. Well, taking a look uh, at Iceland. What can you tell us? Do you see any kinds of uh, projects, people who really have a different idea of um, how bio plus economy can actually come together? Um, what and benefit could be for all of us? Well, like I said, uh, in, or he said, um, I had a longer, I had a longer talk or text. Um, I talked to many people, and the problem was that people understood the word very differently. And I had just been writing a book that is very much about words and how long it can take for a term to catch on. So we're just about to understand sustainability that was coined in the 90s. And I was wondering, do we have time to wait 30 years to understand a term, or should we just continue with an older term? And, and uh, so I was writing my book, Vasserund Sight, and there it was very much about language and, and how it's not until the words are understood that we start to act on them. And that's why I was a bit worried about this concept, because it seemed, when I was just Googling it, it seemed to include backs. It seemed to include bio oil from palm trees. Uh, so it didn't seem to have any ground value in itself of, of being rooted in some kind of strict, firm sustainability. Mm -hmm. So I know many people that are involved in interesting projects in Iceland, in, in algae, in, uh, in uh, producing things from, uh, yeah, from algae, producing things from... Uh, uh, pumping CO2 into the ground and turning it into rock, which seems like a quite feasible things in, in some terms. But uh, what I was kind of also talking about is the vision of the bioeconomies that we kind of dance seamlessly. So I park my Mercedes, oil driven, and I dance into the Tesla, and, and, and I feel like nothing happened. That is, I, I just go from even one comfort, even into more comfort. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this illusion that uh, we don't have to really take any difficult decisions because we will just go from something bad to something better uh, seamlessly. So, because the, the fact is that in the next 30 years, we have to turn off all CO2 emissions, that is, either capture them and, and pump them into the ground or something, and, and the illusion that, and, and, and it seems like we're not aware of the superpowers that we have and, and how we kind of uh, detached ourselves from the earth and the surface of the planet uh, with these superpowers. And so I calculated how much fire we have ignited because we, we have hidden the fires. When I have not seen a fire for a week now maybe a candle yesterday 
in a, in a restaurant, but I have not seen a single fire. Uh, but, but so we have hidden away the fires and we're not aware that we're living the time of the greatest fire mm. on the planet because the 35 gigatons of CO2 are fires. So I translated that in my book. What, what are 100 million tons per day divided by the volcanic eruption in Iceland that was 150,000 tons per day. Mm. And then you get human emissions are like we have 666, I, I'm sorry for this number, it, it's just 100 million divided by 150,000. So it's like humans have created the equal, the equal of 666 if everybody, if anybody remembers the volcanic eruption from 2010 that closed down the airspace in Europe. So, so the fires that we have created are equal to 666 of these volcanoes, not on a day-to-day -day basis, but on a, on a week, on a month, on a year-to-year, decade-after-decade basis. And if you talk to any geologist, Earth has not seen 666 eruptions going on for decades after decade. And that's why we are living the time that we have normalized. We have normalized this, that the leaders of the world, they meet and they talk about the weather. Uh, Genghis Khan did not talk about how he is going to change the Earth's atmosphere. Caesar did not, Napoleon did not. None of the world's leaders <clears throat> had a meeting to talk about if the Earth was going to warm 1.5 degree, 3 degrees. Uh, none of them were talking about their effect on the, the effect of their decisions had on the acidification of the oceans. So in the next 100 years, the oceans are predicted to change more than in the previous 50 million years. Mm -hmm. so, so this is so huge, this is so gigantically huge that that it's bigger than language. It's bigger than the words I can use. I, it's, 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 I can't say it's huge in the 12th degree and make you all cry or something. And if I start crying, somebody will take me to the mental hospital. <laughs> uh, so, so the problem is that we don't, and that's what I was kind of trying to refer to, is that we are living in times that are not precedented. And the decisions we have to take, the economies we have to go into, the inventions, the social progress is so great that it's not about dancing from one type of economy into growing my car mm. through some other way. All right. So, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, Okay, maybe really briefly. I believe um, it's quite fitting. People uh, cry when you see how glaciers melt, how forests are burned. I, I wanted to actually defend the bioeconomy. Why? Because I believe that we do not have bioeconomy in the sense that we, or how we use resources. But the big benefit, the advantage of the approach is the following. We can learn to think systemically and understand that we can only use every single resource only once. And we have to debate holistically to understand how do we prioritize. This is what Ms. Kempfer just mentioned. How do we put our priorities right? And this teaches us to be more humble in our economy and economizing in our growth strategies. And I can see that there is an inherent logic to our ecosystem or e e economic system. We're not doing, doing it just for laughs. Obviously, there's the economy of scales. There is an imminent logic to growth. And nobody's ever found a logic of, of how this could be done. And it would help us a big deal if we could channel the growth into the right direction, making sure it doesn't peak and doesn't experience the um, hysteria we are seeing. It helps us. There is not enough. It, it really is important to understand this. No matter how much uh, high tech we use, no matter how much we tweak and, and fiddle with the genomes, often people call this the hope of the future, which was already around 30 years ago. These are technological dreams, and oftentimes we're just procrastinating, putting it on the long end. But I'm, I'm not trying to be skeptical about technologies. I'm asking you which technology, to what end, which images, what do we need? Little miniature robots 
um, that maybe can harvest our crop more easily. I'm sure I'm, I'm for all for it. Absolutely, I'm in. But the demand, the requirements are important. We have to phrase it right. What do we use to what end? Why? Making sure, like in the old bioeconomy thinking, as much cane sugar from Brazil, as much forest destruction as possible, and import all the sugar we can. You know, um, never mind or the devil may care philosophy. And if you don't mind, mind saying this, uh, the term actually dates back to the 1970s from Jacesco Rügen. He was an economist, and he was trying to describe a shape of economy which uh, stops entropy, slows down the entropy. Um, slowing down the loss of entropy. And he always said, use sun power and get rid of luxury products. And what you just mentioned as well, the cars. You know, and back then already, when SUVs didn't even exist, he said, stop building cars that can accelerate faster than the smoke igniter uh, actually glows up I within your car. This is a nice image to describe that everything has to come together. We need to consume less, being responsible with our natural resources. If you don't mind, can I please? Yes, no, you go, you go, please, by all means. Okay, sorry, I have to butt in but when you mentioned alternative growth strategies. Obviously, being an economist, I can't leave it at this. I believe Maya um, is jumping at the bit as well. She's trying to uh, comment on this. Why? Because growth, what you just mentioned, rightly so, is not a dogmatic thing in the economy. There are different alternatives or understandings to grow more ecologically, ecologically to organize our economy, obviously. And my second comment is this. Uh, indeed, the bioeconomy model is an old one, yes. But you have to translate and apply it to today. And then it has its benefit. Even if you compare it to, if you combine it with this circular economy, with all of today's requirements, protection of the environment, reducing of our emissions, and the differentiation, obviously, in industry states like built Germany, we are in Berlin in a nice building, right? But we have to broaden our perspective, look at the global south. Um, let's talk about um, food, because here we live in an affluent um, surplus society, and we have to reorganize our ways. And at the other hand, um, major or the majority of the people are starving, don't have food. They're lacking access to clean water, to clean energies. So this actually is a question of distribution within one country. Yes, there too, the economy can show answers. But the climate protection are also answers questions to the big global injustice, because smart climate protection makes sure that we have a smarter and more just um, distribution between north and south, global north and global south, between the poor and the rich. Now, these models do exist, if you don't mind, very briefly on that note. And we do have to apply these models. Climate protection is indeed the best requirement and uh, actually occasion to start. It's a long way. And in bioeconomy, too, there's a lot you can do wrong. But it is an opportunity, and this actually brings me back to Christiane Griefe, what you said. Uh, we can find ways, and we have to make uh, find clever ways. Well, uh, if you don't mind, I, I didn't say there aren't other models. I just said that our model is trying to oblige us and to force us in that direction. Right. Three things are very important. Number one, Christian, what you just mentioned, the moment where we perceive nature as it were. This is a mainstream, and the bioeconomy philosophy didn't happen, didn't exist before for a substitute of something. If you in invent something, no matter how or what it is, it's gray, it's technological, it provides uh, a functionality for humankind. Fine, that's good. It's okay to then harvest the resources. And now we've just come to realize that it doesn't work according to plan. So this is very important. But ecologically speaking, or looking at it, the image from before, how can we make use of regenerative cycles? How can we fully understand these cycles? These are like natural laws. And it's not like the market. People tend to say the market is a natural force. No, you can actually manage it. There is distribution, who is calling the shots. There's, it's 
constantly being adapted. Now, we always have to look for solutions. Now, the quest for a solution has to be combined with better indicators for better measurement. And this is a huge and big, important challenge. If there is a big trend, it's the trend or the task for people to ask, um, how about our feedback loops, refinancing our financial systems or social systems? You know, re more sales means more tax. But we have to research that. We have to be really clear about this. We do require a plan B. S Obviously, back in the day, that was entirely different. Other societies said, well, we are hitting the growth limit. We're maxing out our growth. So we do know that the eco limits are obviously required to change in our capitalistic system. We need to rethink our ways. Sustainability has three dimensions. Now, the social dimension, good provision, what Ms. Kepler mentioned. What is quality of life? We are barely asking ourselves that. There's a huge hope story in that. In Corona, we saw this firsthand. You want to have more, possess more. But this is actually not what really drives us, what gives us high quality. And then we have the donut a model. Let's focus on three or four things which people need to lead a dignified life. Number one, we have food, food security, water, food, a roof above our heads, now housing, mobility, like you said, in a different way, speed, obviously, and then daily matters like communication, hygiene, these things. Maslow's needs, there's a certain pyramid, you know this, there's a lot of margin to live or come by without more extraction. And the fourth dimension is fundamental in our discussion. Why? Because it gives us an understanding in terms of, is there this bad news, and like we can't keep on growing? Or maybe people were too stressed out because of the pace. People had to keep working, making sure we keep on growing, which we thought was a challenge. If we don't produce growth, we will get a problem. But actually, this is our task. We really have to communicate this. Social science and eco-science and economy science has found that it is combinable and there are solutions or economic sciences manned produced. This is where we should invest more. Okay, I completely agree. I completely agree. The economists for future, well, they are trying this out and they say this is our mission. This is the responsibility that we have to take on and disaggregate a human development report 2019 was beyond aggregates because in GDP measurements, uh, you know, breaking it down um, to per capita um, uh, does not tell us anything about, you know, it will it reach those who most urgently need it. So we need real facts and figures and not only monetarized, uh, the monetarized world. Okay, very briefly. Are there any questions that you would like to raise from uh, the audience? <laughs> it does not seem to be the case. Okay, Andre. Are you convinced by what you heard? You know, by changing the indicators, by changing the targets, um, will we actually then uh, get rid of these 666 volcanoes? <laughs> yes. So, so basically, you know, what I felt like when I was just looking at the bioeconomy, it didn't seem like it had all these indicators that were needed that would also include biodiversity and, mm -hmm. and all these things. So I'm, I'm not dismissing the term, I'm just, I was just saying, I felt uncomfortable that now when we have to really start acting, that I was trying to understand a new word. So, so we, we uh, one of the things that I think and have been kind of thinking of is, is that just like the difference of mass hysteria is, is mass apathy, that is we, we normalize all that everything is normal. <clears throat> and also, one of the fundamental flaws is our lack of long-term thinking, because we have these four years of democracy and, uh, and uh, 
quarterly annual from, from companies, that uh, when a scientist says 2,100, we don't feel anything. We just, yeah, okay, 2,000. So like I was in Potsdam yesterday talking to the climate scientists and, and they were all showing me these very scary things about 2,100, 2,090, but most people feel like that belongs to science fiction, that just belongs to Marvel Comics. It it's, it's, doesn't belong to us. So we don't react instantly on indicators that are telling us where we're heading in 2090. So, so I often do this experiment when I'm talking to 20-year-olds in universities, ask them a very simple question. When is someone still alive that you will love? It's a very simple question, and, and they ask, what do you mean? I just say, you're born 2000, the universities are full of, sorry guys, 2000 is, is university now. Um, so, so, so they're born 2000, they're 20 year old today, and I ask them, okay, you'll probably become a cool 90 year old, and what year is that? That's 2090, yes. And at that time, you will have a favorite 20 year old, because your children will misunderstand you, like children always misunderstand parents, <laughs> but, but they understand grandparents. And so, so finally you'll have a 20 year old that understands you. And you're 90 and you have a favorite 20-year-old. When is that person born? 2070. And when is that person 90 still talking about you as their greatest influence in their life? And then they do a calculation. Yeah, 2070, that person is 90 in the year 2160. So I tell these university students, the person you will love the most in your life is still talking about you in the year 2160. And it's not an abstract thing, it's not sci-fi, it's just basic continuation of generations. So, so, so you can even write something now, you can even plan an event now in the year 2020, uh, just write one sheet of paper, hand this to this person, and ask him to do this, follow these orders, in the year 2160, mm. something that you planned in the year two, 2020. So, so then I told them, okay, let's just think about this. The person you love the most is out there in the year 2160, and now do you feel like this climate report about 2080 is, is beyond your imagination, or is it only halfway within your intimate idea of your, your intimate time of, of the people that you love. And, and I think culturally we have neglected long-term thinking, long-term planning, and long-term responsibility, and the intimate time of, that we can touch with our bare hands. And, and we just feel, we just act like it does, it's ir irrelevant. So, so that's why if you have like a higher goal or a higher feeling or an intimate feeling about future dates, then you might decide differently, you might choose differently and have a different policy. So I think it's not only about indicators, it's not only about measurements, it's not only about, it's not only about uh, visions, or it's uh, not only about some kind of rules or regulations, it's also culturally how we are kind of installed against the future. Mm. And, uh, and I think that is one of the fundamental flaws and because of this fundamental flaw, we don't do anything. Because we just, we just, uh, we, because we just don't feel anything. And, uh, and I think that is one of the fundamental things that we need is we have to start feeling intimately about these future dates and, and, and not get all messed up with technology or, or cyborgs or whatever, because that alienates the future. That makes the future alienate. So, so when I'm talking to students about the future, I talk about pancake uh, sci-fi, which is basically, it doesn't matter if there are cyborgs or, or what kind of phones will be or flying cars, it doesn't matter. The core aim of humanity is con to continue to be human and to have interactions with other humans 
within uh, societies that are healthy and, and based on fundamental goals, within an earth that has biodiversity uh, and, and, and some health. So, so, and, and so basically, if you can bake pancakes with your grandchild in the year 2140, then we have succeeded. Then it's a, it's a good place. So it's not about techno and stuff like that. So, so sometimes when we're predicting the future, it alienates us because we're always thinking of technology. But it's about continuing to be human and living with animals, oceans, and atmosphere. But isn't that the bridge? Continue to be human? Because I think that what Corona is really brought to the fore again. We are biological beings. And as you said, before all our stories were about next financial big gigs or uploading, I mean, we were very Cartesian in this way of splitting our brain from this body. Yeah. And now all the science tells us, not really true. There is a lot what the body is contributing to what you're thinking and how you're thinking. Yeah. But still, we were talking about uploading oh. our brains into some machinery yeah. into space. So, oh, no problem with the planet going bust. We'll be elsewhere. So now that Corona has invited us back to sensing, actually, that whole idea of suppressing nature, it's like, mach die die Natur untertan, instead of understanding that you're part of it, yeah. And that can be the bridge between the today and the nearer future, to really understand we are also regenerating biological beings. We also need a break. We also need to exhale. We need good food. And all the things that we breathe, all the air, has gone through us into the ground somewhere else multiple times. I mean, when you think of it, we are reconstructing ourselves constantly, and we're totally immersed with everything, the water, the polluted air that makes us very susceptible then to have corona um, pulmonia. I mean, we are nature, and if there's anything that I think provides a new possibility to look at this, is this one planet health agenda to bridge your future view on what it is about. So what is existence of humans on this planet about? That's the question you're posing, right? Yeah, and also it's <laughs> like uh, the corona is, a, is like a, uh, in its evil beauty, that is, oh, so you're an individual. Okay, let's, let's make you all individuals. Okay, try to be an individual for a year. You can't touch anybody. You can't, you can't be crammed in a concert or a bar. You, 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 can't, you can't be like a, a community anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also kind of, the, kind of the evil, kind of meet us, kind of test that we're going through. Okay, so, so I'm not individual. My health is not my own health. I'm sharing the, my health with everybody else. And, and also, I think, as a metaphor, the corona, because now a whole generation has gone through this, you can tell this generation, OK, we just, we just destroyed the economy. Uh, it went like 10% down. Or, or 20, you, you know the figures. You, you, you can tell me the exact figures. We just destroyed the economy for something that we felt was urgent. Uh, Tackling climate change is not about banning you going to the theater, banning you, mm -hmm. preventing you from going to the concerts, mm -hmm. uh, stopping all cultural activity, uh, destroying community. Mm -hmm. uh, corona is actually about community and doing the things that you were talking about, learning, coming together and learning the biological processes. But it's also about, and it's not about not doing things, it's very much about doing things. Mm. And, and Differently, yeah. So, so it can be framed against a, a young generation in a positive way that, that yes, we need maybe 2 or 3 or 5% of the economy, of the GDP, to fix this crisis. But, but that's not money that is just goes into the air. It's, it's actually activity that is created and, and, will, uh, and will have a lot of positive impact. So, like a... A young person going to choose his path in life, it doesn't have to be framed in a negative way because it doesn't matter if you go into fashion, transport, food, energy, every single field and aspect of life that they choose, they will have to be a revolutionary force mm -hmm. because everything has to change. And that is actually quite an, a challenge and interesting to be part of that generation. So it doesn't have to be framed 
in an apocalyptic, gloomy way, it can be framed as a, as a rather positive thing because the things that we're doing are so many negative things that they will find a higher value almost everywhere in this change. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Getting nervous here. Yes, I'm taking a look at my watch. We are already late. Please, if you can be short, I'll be very concise. I do subscribe to what has been said, but I feel odd and funny when you say we, us. It's like the common denominator. We all share, you know, from different societal systems, roles, responsibilities, what we all share. But it's a word, or another word, like framework and politics has not been mentioned. Like, how can we introduce logical frameworks from where we ask questions to other people? How can we slow down life? And how can we create a more just world where other people can um, partake in our resource system? This is what's lacking here. Like science policy, all of that um, research policy is still missing. Who decides where the money goes, into research or where? I believe this is very important when we talk about bioeconomy, a term or something which I deem very interesting uh, in the big context or framework of sustainability, like a subtopic. It's the biggest subtopic. Why? Because it gives us the framework. How can we come to we? I, I also say we all the time. I use the word as well. How do those organize themselves who are looking for sustainable politics? How do they endure conflicts which could, are subject to friction or will cause friction when you transition over to new frameworks? And there are conflicts and friction. Last question. Have we met inroad over the past few years? <laughs> we, again, we, have we met inroads of progress? We, no, I would say yes, we've made progress. Like in energy politics, depending, there are dependencies, pathway dependencies. There are many decisions in the energy economy at the expense of small farmers, at the expense of you know, land use, monocultures, all of that. Obviously, I believe that's a lesson learned, but it's still there because there are still contracts that are still good, there are big agreements still in place, big facilities still standing there, and they are still running. But the debate has changed towards circular economy and like how can bioeconomy bio become a part of it. But we have to strengthen that connection and that we need political framework conditions to link it up. And I believe, yes, and we've made some progress, small progress though, due to reality and we've all been startled by reality. It's all happened. Everything which was predicted in 1970 has happened. It's tangible. It's not like our kids will this and that. No, the forests are already burning. Okay. Okay. Huge topic. Way too little time. Is there another question? Many questions? One question. This is a question coming from the live stream. Is green growth conceptualizable? Is it possible and sustainable? Doesn't every growth mean using more resources and drawing on the planet? That's a question for whom? I would like to take it up. I would, I would like to answer that question or comment on it, if you can tip in, if you will. There is no yes or no answer to this question, obviously, but we've heard it times and again in this debate, but in general. Growth at the expense of nature, at the expense of future generation, is problematic and it'll cause knock-on effects and uh, green gas emissions and, you know, more burden on the agricultural system. So I understand that people tend to focus on growth, but Maya Goebel um, summarized it well. It's also about the terminology of nature and nature grow, growth grows, but there is a circle, a circular system. We are part of nature as well. We are also part of the problem as well as part of the solution. This is why we have to rethink economy as well, in the sense that we will have to find solutions as to not to introduce green growth, but to actually incorporate and implement circular economy. It's not 
a natural law, like that the way we act is what, because we act like that. No, on at the expense of future generations. No, we have to stop it. We have to stop our ways and rethink them. There are so many regions in the world that cannot grow because they are lacking access to agriculture or to clean drinking water or to any form and shape of energy for that matter. So I refuse to focus on energy terminology from our perspective. I do not like that. It's more about making it accessible um, a viable future and a future um, worthwhile living. And Andre mentioned this in his book. When we think about the fact that we are all sitting at a table, not only with our grandkids, but also our grand-grandkids, and then they ask us questions, and we have to answer these question, questions. This is how it becomes more graspable, what this kind of task it is we are faced for us and for future generations. So I believe we are at a watershed, at a tipping point as well, to debate green growth, yes, but far beyond that because we require fundamental transition processes. If you mind, if you don't mind, two words. We have to start and ask ourselves, what do we mean when we say growth? I believe the question actually was referring to economical growth. If we're talking about GDP, the Club of Rome, limits of growth, has a different understanding. It was about the metral uh, throughput and so on. In a way, we can't max it out or increase it further anymore. So there are limits. There's a cap on this. There are f physical limits as to what we can extract from the nature, from nature, and maintain our system. GDP, odd thing, constantly changing. And, you know, we could also include the housework of everybody, which is not part of the GDP. Then the GDP would be enormous. Why not? So the GDP problem is a big one. It keeps popping up like a very objective indicator, but it's not. It's just a statistical number, and it's been aggregated, um, interpolated, extrapolated, and projected. But let's not, rather, let's debate uh, about the fact that there are many regions in the world that need more fundamental resources and access to it. Right. But if you are an investor, a businessman, businesswoman, if your reasoning is, I want to maximize profit, I want to grow a lot, and I want to be profitable. And I believe you are going to start uh, a way or besides low-income areas, regions in the world. The re needs of the poorest should be met as a priority, even more so if we notice that what we extract is limited. Right, and this brings us back to bioeconomy, completing the circle nice way of wrapping up here because this is what it's all about at the end of the day, making sure that the agro systems actually cover our needs. But I, I, coming back to the question from before, I actually understood it to be meant as economic growth. Okay, one final question, very final question. Does sustainability also mean automatically that the liberal system which has to fall apart radically because it assumes there are no limits or no frontiers. I believe we've just covered that, I believe. We've just given the answer to that question with our uh, economy system, how to frame it. I believe we've already covered that question. But, uh, but there are old liberal thinking thinkers or we needed framework conditions we needed this framework to understand how can we work and uh, Ricardo and Adam Smith these were liberal thinkers but they, were, uh, they also in included feedback loops we didn't disembed it from society this only came much later okay okay We've covered a lot of ground now. I've learned so much, many questions are on my mind. I hope you have questions as well. The first question is, on what logic is our system operating on? 
our economic system. How do we measure it? This is a very crucial question. Question number three, who is that we? Question number four, maybe the most important of all of them, how does your pancake future look? And if you have an answer to that, the entire climate crisis, sustainability, 666 active volcanoes and bioeconomies, 666, a number I never, will never forget. I think all of that will become much easier. Thank you so much to all panelists. Thanks so much for joining us here today. Thanks to our hosts. And outside, Andri is going to sign his books. And in the shop, you can buy the books of our panelists here. Do read them. I've read them all, and they are great. Thank you so much.